Hi, I'm Diana Motes, a third grade teacher in Cobb County, Georgia, and I'm here to talk about differentiation in mathematics for a diverse group of learners. Before we get started, I'd like you to imagine that you are a doctor instead of a truly fabulous teacher. I know it may sound strange, but go with me on this. Okay, so you have an office full of patients waiting to see you for treatment. The first person you meet with has a scraped knee, so you give him a Band-Aid. The second person you meet with has a broken arm, and you give her a Band-Aid. Then the third person you meet with has a fever, and you give him a Band-Aid. The second and third patients leave frustrated and still in need of help. Did we treat the patients accordingly? The answer is a pretty obvious no. While the Band-Aid adequately treated the first patient, the second and third patients needed different treatments. As the doctor, we needed to assess our patients and determine the most appropriate treatment that would meet their needs. Now, as a doctor, we have the luxury of meeting with one patient at a time. As teachers, we don't have that luxury every day. As teachers, we have a diverse group of students who all have different backgrounds, experiences, and levels of knowledge, but who are all expected to learn the same standards. So as we slip back into our teacher roles, we are going to look at ways that we can differentiate for a variety of learners in our classrooms. If you would like to access the handout for my presentation, please visit the resource room of the Summit platform to download. Let's talk about why we should differentiate in mathematics. A few years ago, I got a phone call from a parent after school. She was ecstatic that her child got off the bus in the best mood. The parent said that the girl ran in from the bus like never before declaring, today was the best ever. We did these math activities where we physically moved around the class to make the different problems with our bodies. And mom, it was so fun. And I could see and understand how the problem was done. For the first time, I really got it easily. Math has never been like this and it was so fun. Mrs. Motes really gets me and how I need to learn. I am so happy. That day, the parent is referring to, we started our new multiplication and division math unit. I spent time creating lessons for this unit that incorporated kinesthetic learning into the activities. We practiced the groups of multiplication strategy with students inside hula hoops, hopped along poly spots on the floor with groups of counting bears, sang a chant about multiplication, and practiced movements or gestures to help us answer multiplication problems with visuals on the board. Not only were the students engaged, but they seemed to really get it. As a teacher, this is the kind of feedback that I love, knowing that I did something to create a light bulb moment that has forever made a difference in this student's life and their confidence in mathematics is empowering. One of the leading experts in differentiation notes, differentiation is classroom practice that looks eyeball to eyeball with the reality that kids differ. And the most effective teachers do whatever it takes to hook the whole range of kids on learning. And that's by Carol Ann Tomlinson. When talking about differentiation, it's important to note that according to Tomlinson, there are four ways to differentiate instruction, content, process, product, and learning environment. Tomlinson and McTie note, many teachers attempt to differentiate instruction by giving struggling learners less and advanced learners more, but this isn't particularly helpful. So when we differentiate, we are making changes to one or more of these elements. Today, we will explore ideas around process, learning environment, as well as assessments and goal setting. Let's begin looking at ways we can differentiate the process. Process is how the students will access the information. First, let's talk about strategies for different learning styles. We all have our own unique experiences and our brains learn in different ways. Students who are learning the English language will struggle with vocabulary and need lots of visuals. Students who have a significant weakness in memory will likely need information chunked and would benefit from the use of mnemonic devices. Students who struggle with executive functioning may have difficulty attending to lessons. Have you ever heard the phrase, know your audience? For teachers, this is paramount. 
we have to understand what our students know and have some idea about how their brains learn in order for our teaching to have the maximum effect. I strive to incorporate strategies for the different learning styles as often as I can in my whole group instruction so that my teaching is universally effective. Tomlinson and McTighe note that teachers who regularly employ a range of strategies are more likely to connect what needs to be learned with the full range of students who need to learn it. I include visuals, anchor charts, graphic organizers, songs, chants, and opportunities for movement throughout much of my mathematics instruction. I love using anchor charts when I begin a new standard with students. It's helpful for students to have a sample problem or diagram to refer back to so they know what the grade level standard expectation is. For example, when I introduce our multiplication standard, I will give students a copy of their own anchor chart for their math notebook that has examples of each multiplication strategy drawn out. We also hang up a version in the classroom. One big way that I include movement in my instruction is through our fact fluency initiative. I like to teach my students to skip count using a cross lateral movement sequence. By crossing the midline, we help to engage both sides of the brain to improve our attention, memory, and focus. Learning skip counting can help students tremendously as they learn their multiplication facts. Now let's talk about small group instruction. When I hear the term differentiation, the idea of small group instruction typically accompanies it. Small group instruction embedded within the workshop model should be a given. In my classroom, my math block follows the workshop model. This means that I begin with a short whole group mini lesson. After this, we move to our work time. During this time, students will work independently on assignments like math games, task cards, computer software, or basic worksheets. While students are actively working, I have an opportunity to pull a small group of students to meet with me. Small group instruction allows me to tailor instruction to better meet the needs of my students. I may pull a group of students for intervention, or I may pull a group of students that need an extension. Not only can I tailor the instruction of the small group of students with me, but I can also differentiate the independent tasks that students are working on. One easy way to get started with this is through utilizing technology and software resources, if you have access to it. There are many EdTech options out there that allow you to assign tasks to specific students or groups of students. Following work time in the workshop model is a short closing. This time allows you to recap or summarize the learning target for the day. You can even have students utilize a summarizing strategy that can give you valuable feedback moving forward. The next strategy I'd like to talk about is pre-teaching concepts or vocabulary. This is a great strategy for English language learners. By exposing them to vocabulary and concepts in a small group before a whole group lesson, they are likely to feel more confident with the new information in whole group instruction. They may feel more like an expert going into a lesson and be more likely to actively participate. Again, this is a great option for small group instruction. Another way to help English language learners or struggling students is to activate prior knowledge of a concept before teaching it. For example, if you were solving word problems as a class about the cost of purchasing candy from a candy store, you may show a video clip of a candy store so that students can better comprehend what's happening in the word problem. Or if you're solving a word problem that's trying to determine the total number of legs of animals on a farm, you may pull up the images of those animals so students can visualize the number of legs each animal has. Finally, let's talk about how partnering can be an effective differentiation strategy. We have to give our students more credit. They are fabulous teachers in their own right. Oftentimes, they can explain things in kid language or in a way we may not think to explain it. I love utilizing partner activities in the classroom for this reason. One way that I utilize partnering in the classroom is during my whole group instruction. Oftentimes, I will have the students repeat a vocabulary term to a partner along with a visual or movement to help them take ownership of their learning. For example, when I taught first grade and we learned about expanded form, we would use this movement to stretch out and visualize the meaning of the term expanded form. Then we would show that it's essentially decomposing a number because we would say it's the tens plus the ones while literally holding up 10 fingers, a plus sign and one finger. 
Now, with students repeating this to a partner and modeling with some sort of visual or movement, they have become the teacher to their partner, giving them agency over a small, manageable part of the lesson. This also gives students a break from sitting and just listening or responding to the teacher. Our young students have short attention spans, so it's important that we are able to maintain their engagement. Another way I utilize partnering in the classroom is through activities during work time. I may partner students early on with learning a specific skill or standard so that they have another brain to help them think through the process and discuss possible answers. For example, we work on word problems all year long. For third graders, this is a complex standard with doing two steps and using any of the four operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. I'll start off modeling working through word problems using our strategies myself and gradually release more of the work to them. Putting students in partners allows them opportunities to explain their reasoning to someone else and get feedback on whether or not their answer is reasonable. We will also utilize partnering during challenging activities. I am very strategic with this though. Sometimes I will pair students with like abilities and sometimes I will pair students with varying abilities. This often depends on the task itself and the students involved. For example, if I have students who tend to sit back while others work, I may partner them together so that they don't have the option to sit and wait. When I do this, I also have the understanding that this particular group may need more support from me during this process. If I have students who are at the early stages of learning English, I will often pair them with students who are bilingual with the same native language, if possible. For English language learners, this can make all the difference because it's often a case of a lack of understanding rather than not knowing. While there are many strategies to differentiate process, hopefully these are an easy springboard to get you started differentiating. Now let's talk about learning environment or how the learning is structured. I pride myself on having a positive classroom environment. In my classroom, there are two big ways that I differentiate the learning environment that contribute to this encouraging atmosphere. Those are flexible seating and using a growth mindset. As an adult, do you have difficulty sitting through a presentation in a fixed position? Do you find it challenging to be still while listening to a speaker? How many of you have already fidgeted in your seat while listening to this presentation? Personally, I know I would find it challenging. I might shift in my seat or turn to look if I hear a noise. This is one reason why I implemented flexible seating in my classroom. If you are new to flexible seating, let me explain. This is the idea that students learn best and work best when they are in a spot that is comfortable and productive. In my classroom, I have a variety of seating options that include yoga balls, therapy balls, wobble stools, wiggle cushions, stools, bicycle pedals, chairs with resistance bands, and regular chairs. Many of these options allow for students to move while they are working. Some studies show that flexible seating options can be helpful for special education students, such as students with autism spectrum disorder or students with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. In my experience as a special education teacher, I found it very helpful to consult with our occupational therapist about what seat options might best meet student needs. It's important to note that not every seating type is best for all students. For example, some students may lack the postural stability needed to sit on a yoga ball or a therapy ball. Obviously, it's also very important to set ground rules, expectations, and have clear procedures for flexible seating. I train my students before beginning flexible seating. We don't start off on the first day. We discuss responsibilities of flexible seating and they sign a contract stating they understand the agreement before being allowed choice. They also have to acknowledge that the choice is a privilege that they can potentially lose if they don't follow the rules and expectations. The goal is to create a workspace where students can stay focused and engaged. Now, have you ever heard someone say they aren't a math person? Ever had students who told you they hate math? Many of our students continue to feed the narrative that some people just aren't math people. They may even recycle this narrative because they see or hear it from their parents. They may have had bad experiences with math because of a learning disability or difficulty focusing. Another important piece of the puzzle for my classroom learning environment is to teach my students how to have a growth mindset. 
This is a strategy I use to modify the learning environment to meet student emotional needs. The idea behind a growth mindset is the belief that we can improve our brain's ability or capacity over time. Just because we don't know something doesn't mean that we can't eventually learn it. It just means that we don't know it yet. Many of our students today are plagued with a notion that is likely passed down from parents that they just aren't good at math. How many people, adults or students, can you think of that you have heard talk about themselves in this way? Two years ago, I had a student with attention deficit disorder that openly admitted that he didn't like math and wasn't good at it. He blurted it out in front of the whole class. My response to him was a challenge to change his perception and to get him to like math. I try to explain to my students that we are all math people. We all have our own unique set of strengths. Some of us might be good at identifying patterns. Some might be fact masters and others might be great at using math reasoning. Lo and behold, after many months of trying to make math fun, relevant and relatable, he finally declared that something in math was actually fun. I called that a win. Like this student, many of our students that experience challenges from a learning disability or health issue really struggle with self-confidence in academics. In my classroom, I teach my students about the brain and we learn about ways to make our brains grow. This idea is paramount to get students to feel like they even have the opportunity to experience success in math so that they will actually try. I've seen many students sit back and wait for me to give them the answer before they even attempt it themselves. They declare that it's too difficult or they don't understand. I always urge them to try because that's where I can help them learn from their mistakes. And when we learn from our mistakes, that's truly powerful. On the flip side, I've also seen learners who typically excel get frustrated in math the first time something is difficult for them. I refer them back to the idea of having a growth mindset and remind them that it's my job to challenge them and to stretch their brain so that it will grow. Persevering in mathematics is an important part of the process. I also work hard to praise students when they experience a growing moment. We celebrate when we find our mistakes. We celebrate when we share our thinking using math talk. And we celebrate when we come up with reasonable solutions. Stopping to celebrate small victories along the way can really boost the morale of students. I have found this to be extremely helpful in teaching students with disabilities and students with ADD or ADHD. Many students with ADD or ADHD have a negative self-perception and can get frustrated easily. Pointing out small moments where they did something right can go a long way for their confidence. The last areas we are going to explore today are assessments and goal tracking. Now that we've talked about different ways to differentiate in the math classroom, let's talk about how you know who needs what. Assessments are vital in order to differentiate instruction. One assessment idea that I'd like to focus on is the exit ticket. Exit tickets are great formative assessments that you can give quickly and grade quickly. Just like our students, I can get overwhelmed with grading if I feel like it's going to take too much time. This is one reason why I like using short exit tickets. Being able to grade assessments in a timely manner is important to continue to drive instruction appropriately and to provide timely feedback to students. This is the main reason that my grade level team shifted our formative assessments away from some of the other assessments and worksheets that we used to use. With exit tickets, I can narrow my focus down to a specific skill with only one or a couple of questions or problems. For example, if I'm teaching fractions, I may give an exit ticket on unit fractions only as students need to understand this skill or part of the standard before moving on to more challenging fraction concepts. By narrowing my focus, I can pinpoint exactly what my students may need help with. I'll even keep a spreadsheet with student responses so that I know what problems students excelled at and struggled with. As I go through and quickly grade, I can usually sort the assessments into about three groups, those who clearly understand, those who show some understanding, and those who need more support to understand. Sometimes I might sort into two or four groups depending on the data or assessment. This is the idea of creating flexible groups. 
students won't always be grouped with the same students because their performance or expertise may change depending on the standard and their own strengths. For example, a student may struggle with addition and subtraction, but they might excel in geometry. This is how I plan my small group instruction and how I know who needs remediation. Another helpful idea for exit tickets or other assessments is to have students rate their level of understanding as they turn in their assignment. Some of our exit tickets have smiley or frowny faces that the students can color in to show their level of understanding. I also use a high letter system in my classroom. When students turn in an assignment, they choose a color to highlight their name with. The choice of color is supposed to represent how well they understood the assignment. This is a helpful tool to get an idea of student confidence with a standard or skill. Sometimes student reflection will match up with their performance and other times it won't. It's all beneficial information as you plan for differentiation and in instruction. Finally, in order for students to accomplish an academic goal and to grow, they have to understand where their current performance falls and what the goal is. When students look at their own personal data and get an explanation of the target, they are better suited to create a plan to attack and achieve. Tomlinson and McTie suggest the most effective learners are mindful of how they learn, set personal learning goals, and self-assess. My students have data folders that we reference throughout the year. We use these to track progress on a few assessments and priority standards during the course of the year. There is also an opportunity to practice graphing skills and statistical reasoning here. I explain to students the end of the year expectations so that they know what is considered to be on grade level. We talk about SMART goals and have them think about and create a plan to achieve their goals. SMART goals are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. Using SMART goals helps students to create meaningful and realistic academic goals. For example, if a student says that their goal is to get better at math, it's not specific, may be difficult to measure, and it isn't time bound. Students spend time reflecting on their assessment scores, graded work, how they feel in class, and use this information to help them determine a course of action to achieve their goals. If students are already meeting grade level expectations, I encourage them to push themselves a little higher. I have students think about what next steps they need to take in order to reach their goals. They create short plans and think about what resources they need to work toward their goal or who needs to be there to help them. Maybe they need a resource like flashcards or access to a particular software. Maybe they will enlist the help of a sibling or me, the teacher, to help them with a particular part of their plan. Remember, a goal is just a dream if you don't create a plan to achieve it. When we differentiate and make adjustments in our teaching, we empower a variety of learners to feel more confident in mathematics and experience success. It's important to note that differentiation is not a specific plan that is ready to go and work in all classrooms. Without differentiation, students are likely to fall through the cracks and academic gaps could worsen. Without differentiation, you are likely to see behavior problems when students are bored or disengaged. If you have been struggling with meeting the needs of your students, I hope that you are inspired to try some of these strategies or ideas. As teachers, we have the important role of educating our future. When your students leave your classroom, they may not remember every single thing that you taught them, but they will likely remember how you made them feel. Let them leave us feeling as though they are thinkers, they are capable, and they are math people.